I'm Rebecca McLaughlin Duane, and this week we have an exclusive interview with Saudi Arabian fashion designer to the stars, Hatem Al Akil, as he discusses the evolution of the Abaya and his film about female empowerment in the kingdom. Later in the show, we'll meet a Jordanian architect who has reinvented herself as a contemporary dance teacher, and she loves to perform in the streets around the monuments of her native Amman. First, when economic times are tough, buying the latest best-selling books on a regular basis is an extravagance for many in the MENA region. Imad Maki reveals how some entrepreneurial Egyptians are writing a new chapter in the book trading business. This is Al Ataba Square, Cairo's busiest and most famous market. It is known for low-grade products and cheap merchandise. It's not known as a hub of culture, but behind this facade, there lies a cultural treasure, a book market that young Egyptians come to in big numbers for good bargains. Cairo has traditionally been a vibrant cultural center in the Middle East, but as the country faces economic hardships, including the devaluation of the Egyptian pound, young book lovers are resorting to buying second-hand volumes to satisfy their passion for literature. This form of recycled reading is rapidly becoming a trend. You can just send me to a place where I can read stories and I will ask for nothing more. We are students and we don't have much money. Here, we can buy five or six books for the price of two elsewhere. At fancy bookstores like Diwan, in the upscale neighborhood of Zamanic, international bestsellers like Harry Potter or The Diary of a Wimpy Kid are selling for more than 250 Egyptian pounds. That's 15 US dollars. In Azbekia book market, they go for less than one US dollar. Heba is the only female second-hand bookseller in Azbekia market. Hair trade is something of a family tradition, with her father having been in the same business. Her father once told her that books were the most important thing in life. That sentence lives with me till this day. It made me respect books immensely, and I don't like anyone to belittle books. I love customers who respect books. Young people read a lot of books about self-improvement, horror, and romance. Young people care about culture now a lot more than before. They read about politics, history, economy, philosophy. They read everything. As Bekeya's book recycling business model has proved successful, and its popularity is spreading fast. <laughs> The biggest threat the market faces in the years to come could be the availability of free downloadable books online. However, if traditionalists like Ahmed continue to encourage others to take a leaf out of their book, the second-hand market might just survive and even thrive. Paper books have no competition. I like the smell of paper itself. I like the color of yellow pages. It's a different world. Saudi Arabian designers of robes known as Tobes and Kunduras can claim to have dressed American rapper Snoop Dogg when he came to the region. But Hatem al Akil can do just that. He sat down with Inspire for an exclusive interview to talk about the social and economic changes he's witnessing in his home country and, of course, about the shifting sands of traditional fashion. The social and economic role of women in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is changing at a rapid pace. And for the past five years, Saudi designer Hatem al Akil has been watching from the wings, quietly helping ladies make a statement with their clothes. Instead of conservative black abayas, Hatem created kimono-inspired long jackets with geometric collars and intricate embroidery, and the pieces have sent ripples around the region. 
Most recently, the designer has also turned his hand to film directing, putting Saudi women in the driving seat in a short movie which shows an empowered lady taking control of her life and steering it in a new direction. Alongside his film foray, Hattam continues to pen menswear designs for his label Toby, which he launched in 2008 and earned him the nickname King of Conduras. Reflecting the designer's international upbringing in Jeddah, Switzerland and Boston, his robes are diverse and unconventional, given their sharp silhouettes, statement colours and contemporary flourishes. A style not only adopted by gentlemen of the region, but also the likes of Snoop Dogg and Christian Louboutin. Hatem, a very warm welcome to Inspire Middle East. Thank you for speaking to Euronews. Thank you for having me. Across all of your ranges, women's wear, men's wear and children, how far can you push the creative envelope when it comes to design, especially within Saudi Arabia? But with the men's, you really have to stop at a certain point, you know, uh, especially if it's something that's, you know, practical and, and everyday wear, you know, uh, there's only very few pieces, you know, the, the Snoop Dogg, the Tobe, the creative Tobe, the, the ones that are more red carpet fashion piece statements. Uh, but the ones that, that we also need to take into account is the everyday wear, uh, classic Tobes that still have my twist, uh, but need to be more uh, practical. The abaya, the traditional garments worn by women across the Middle East and often North Africa, has undergone something of an evolution in recent years. How do you view it from a design standpoint? There's a whole modest movement now that's kind of, you know, become quite a, uh, a large trend. Uh, I do think it's fantastic when you have models like Halima, you know, uh, on international uh, platforms, uh, wearing Milan, New York uh, Fashion Week, representing uh, the Middle Eastern, uh, more modest, traditional, uh, Arabic or Islamic. Uh, I'm giving you so many words because this is what it represents. It represents many things, not just modest, it's many, many avenues of what, you know, our culture is about. I'm curious to know, living and working in Saudi, how are the changes that we've recently heard about affecting your day-to-day -day life? See, I think, you know, there's more opportunities. I think uh, certain doors that were, that were closed then are open now in different industries because of the lack of corruption and no tolerance for corruption as well. Um, it's not so much who you know, it's what you know and what you're able to, to offer. Tell me about your latest film, in particular with the Saudi woman behind the wheel of a car. Uh, we chose a lady like Bayan Linjawi, who is uh, basically represents what the millennial is, is educated, uh, young, uh, is an entrepreneur, uh, is an influencer. Video is about, it's about empowerment. And at the same time, it's a very simple story of this lady walking out of her house, where she finally, you know, gets to uh, dream, and she is into a new reality, found a new freedom, and uh, freedom to drive. I think the whole movement of uh, the word Sa'akud, which is the name of, of the campaign, Sa'akud, I will drive, has different meanings. Well, one meaning is I will drive, and the other meaning is I will lead. Hatem, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. The pleasure is entirely mine. Thank you. One Jordanian architect turned dancer has taken to using the buildings, streets, and staircases of the capital Amman as her stage. Salim Saeed stepped into the world of the choreographer, who has taken the lead in building a stronger dance community in her city. If you're wondering what this woman is doing, you're not alone. Shirin Talhouni is a contemporary artist doing something called site-specific dance, which means her movement is not confined to the walls of a room. The city, corridors, people on the street. All the world is her stage, and Shirin, merely a dancer. On a stage, I feel the sets are normally just decorative, or, you know, it's different. With site-specific work, you're trying to highlight something about the environment through the work itself. Like in the city of Amman, which is known for its long staircases, to get a feel of what it's like for a disabled person, she moved down the stairs without lifting her head. And she just happened to be seven months pregnant. Where did this idea of connecting movement and her surroundings come from? Well, Shirin was a working architect until the age of 30, when she was inspired to pursue her passion for dance. Yet she didn't want to lose her love for exploring the connection between people and their surroundings, her favorite part of architecture. 
I used to love that process, you know, researching and looking at how people live and discovering things about the place from observing it. But then we got to the building part. I always felt, oh, you know, now it's this part. Shireen is a woman doing it all. She's an architect, dancer, mother, and also a teacher. On top of all that, with her class here, she wants to develop Jordan's dance community. It's a space in Amman where you, you, know, you have space to be yourself, really be yourself. In a way, I think uh, the, the city doesn't have those kind, offer those kind of spaces. Being a, able to express sensuality, this is not accepted in our society. Especially for men, I think it's uh, kind of shameful for them to express in their body, except through rage. <laughs> this is especially true for 20-year-old Mustafa Al Shalabi. For him, this is not just a dance class. It's an escape from the pressures of everyday life. In this hour, I, I have like no shame, no judgment, nothing, literally nothing on my mind. A complete hour of happiness. It's a therapy. I mean, people go to a therapist. I come to this class. Dancing is for everyone, but in this society, it's not for everyone. That's a wrap from Dubai. Before I leave you, here's what caught the attention of the Inspire team on social media. Popular lifestyle blogger Anjoud from Saudi took this sunny snap in her shades and embellished abaya. Dina from Jordan uploaded this clip of her dance class rehearsing in Amman. And Egyptian book reviewer Jasmine shared this image of her shopping at an eclectic store at Cairo's International Book Fair.